We now come to the questions of the Prime Minister. Number one is Neil Hudson. Dr Neil Hudson. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, during which uh, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, updated the Cabinet on how the Government's plan for jobs is working, with higher wages, higher skills and rising productivity. He will make a statement to the House shortly, setting out how we will build a new age of optimism, Mr Speaker. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Dr Neil Hudson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I very much welcome the A66 Northern Trans Pennine project from Penrith to Scotch Corner. This £1 billion investment will improve safety and congestion and help to level up our region, supporting jobs, essential services and tourism. But we have to get the project right. Will my right honourable friend ask his government departments for Transport, the Ministry of Defence and DEFRA to work together pragmatically and reasonably with suggested route amendments to ensure local communities such as Walcott, Musgrave and Sanford are not left blighted by these current plans. Mr Speaker, he's, uh, he's right that uh, the, the, the development that he re refers to is part of a, uh, an infrastructure revolution I think will transform the country, uh, but he's also right that we should consider local feedback uh, from stakeholders and the community when finalising the design, and so we will. Unfortunately, the Leader of the Opposition is isolating, so I'm calling Ed Miliband to ask the question on behalf of the Opposition. Ed Miliband. Th thank you. Uh... Just, just like the old days. Just, just to say, I presume you all want to get onto the budget because all you're doing is delaying it. Ed Miliband. I, I just want to reassure both sides of the house: it's one time only that I'm back. Uh, mi mi Mr. Mi mi Mr. Mr. Speaker, we all need the vital COP26 summit in Glasgow to deliver uh, next week because failing to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees will have devastating consequences for our planet, and that is shared across this House. Does the Prime Minister agree that to keep that goal of 1.5 degrees alive, we need to roughly halve global emissions in this decisive decade? Well, I, I welcome the right honourable gentleman to, uh, to his place, and, and indeed, I think, I, I think the whole House will extend uh, our sympathies to the, to the leader of the opposition. I hope he uh, returns, uh, returns soon. Uh, it is, of course, uh, correct, Mr. Speaker, that uh, COP26 is both unbelievably important for our planet, uh, but also very difficult, and it's in the balance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, he's right in what he says about the need to, to keep 1.5 degrees alive, and that will be, and it does depend on what happens this decade. It depends on the commitments uh, that are made. All I will say, Mr. Speaker, is that already very substantial commitments under the UK uh, presidency, presidency designate of COP, have been achieved, and we've moved from only 30% of the global economy uh, committed to a net zero by the middle of the century to now 80%. And uh, every day, as I talk talk to international leaders, we hear further commitments to make those solid commitments that the world will need. Whether it is enough, Mr Speaker, I'm afraid it is too early to say. Ed Miliband. Mr Speaker, I applaud the efforts of the UK Presidency under the President-designate uh, Sharma, but, but I do want to direct the Prime Minister's attention to the issue of this decade. I'll come to net zero targets for the middle of the century in a moment, but yesterday a very important report came out from the United Nations, which he will know, the UNEP emissions gap uh, report. And on the eve of COP, it warned that far from halving global emissions this decade, we're only on course to reduce them by about 7%. 0.5 per cent. Does the Prime Minister acknowledge, because this is crucial for what happens at Glasgow and after Glasgow, does the Prime Minister acknowledge how far away we are from the action required in this 10-year period? Prime Minister. M Mr Speaker, indeed I do, but I think what the House should also recognise is how far we have moved just in the space of a, a few years since the, since the Paris 
COP summit of 2015, where, uh, if, as I'm sure the, the right honourable gentleman uh, will remember, the world agreed to, to net zero by 2100, by the end uh, of the century, and, and, agreed, and agreed to try to restrain global warming by four degrees. We're now trying to keep alive the prospect of restricting that growth to 1.5 degrees. Every day, Mr Speaker, countries are coming through with solid commitments on uh, stopping the output of, of coal-fired power stations, uh, reducing their use on internal combustion engines, planting millions of trees and investing uh, hundreds of billions of pounds in the developing world. That is, uh, those are solid commitments. Whether they're going to be enough, Mr Speaker, I'm afraid it is still uh, I'm too early to say. I'm the commitments. I just correct the Prime Minister on one point. It was the second half of this century set out in Paris, not 2100 for net zero. But, but, but here's the problem, Prime Minister, on this question of net zero targets for the middle of the century. It's easy to make promises for 30 years' time. It's much more difficult to act now. Australia has recently announced a 2050 net zero target, but its 2030 target would head the world towards approximately four degrees of global warming. Can I urge him he mustn't shift the goalposts when it comes to Glasgow. It is about the emergency we face this decade. It's about the NDCs this decade. Please keep the focus on 2030, not 2050 and beyond. Yeah. Well, uh, the focus is, is certainly on, uh, on 2030. We have 122 uh, nationally determined contributions already. Uh, 17 out of 20 uh, G20 countries have made uh, NDCs. And, and the commitments are, are coming through. And he's right to say uh, that we need to keep the, the pressure up. What you can't do, Mr. Speaker, is go in advance of what is truly practicable uh, for, for the world economy and for what, and for what people uh, can do. Uh, this government will go as fast as we, as we possibly can. Uh, but it, it was um, Labour's plans, which I think he, he endorsed, were condemned by the, the GMB union. For, 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 which they're, they're, they're paymasters, Mr. Speaker, uh, for, for, for meaning uh, that they'd be confiscating people's cars uh, by 2030, and, you, and families would be only allowed one aeroplane flight every five years, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me tell him what this summit needs is statesmanship, not partisanship, which we just heard from the Prime Minister. He should not be trying to score party political points on such an important issue facing our country and our world. Uh, um, that, that's never the way I did PMQs. Uh, now, now, let me ask him, now let me, let me ask him about, about the crucial issue of climate finance for developing countries. Because the, 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 the reason that the Paris summit succeeded was there was a coalition of vulnerable countries and developed countries that put pressure on all the big emitters, including China, including India. But the problem is that the world has not delivered on the $100 billion of finance promised more than a decade ago in Copenhagen, that the plan is to deliver it maybe in 2023. But I want to ask him about his actions. I want to ask him about his actions. Hasn't it made it much harder to deliver on this promise that we are the only G7 country to cut the aid budget in the run-up to this crucial summit? Uh, Mrs. Speaker, I thought we weren't going to have any partisan points. <laughs> Didn't last long. Uh, Ms. Actually, the first, the first thing I did, uh, as one of the first things I did uh, as Prime Minister, was to go out to uh, my first Unger as Prime Minister, as UN General Assembly as Prime Minister, and announce a, a huge £11.6 billion commitment from the UK to helping the developed world to tackle climate change. And, 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 and I'm going to say to the right, right honourable, yes, of course it's true. And we haven't cut that. We have not cut that, Mr. Speaker. We're keeping that investment. We're keeping that investment. And, and let me tell the right honourable gentleman that this country is working flat out to ensure that we do reach the £100 billion commitment from the whole of the world. We're seeing the money come in from the United States, from the Italians, from the French, from, from the European Union. And it's quite right that it should. We have a way to go, Mr. Speaker. Whether we'll get there or not, I cannot say. It's in the balance. But the challenge is there for the leaders of the developed world. And I quite agree with the right honourable gentleman. They need to rise to it. Speaker, it's one thing for him not to know what is in the Paris Agreement, but it's another thing not to know what's in his own budget. He has cut the aid budget. Of course he's cut the aid, of course he's cut the aid budget. He's abandoned the bipartisan belief in the aid budget across both of these houses. But it's not just on aid, Mr Speaker, where they face both ways. 
They have got a trade deal with Australia where they have allowed them to drop their temperature commitments. They are telling others to power past coal while flirting with a new coal mine. And they are saying we have got to move beyond fossil fuels and opening the new Cambo oil field. Isn't the truth? Isn't the truth, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister has undermined his own COP presidency by saying one thing and doing another? Yeah. Prime Minister. No, no, Mr Speaker. What, 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 what? And he's completely wrong. He is completely wrong in what he's and, and I think he should he should with, I think he should withdraw what he's just said about, about the eleven point six billion. Uh, because we remain absolutely committed to the £11.6 billion pounds that we're investing to tackle climate change around the world. And, uh, and, and, if he, and that, is, uh, that is absolutely rock solid. And, and he talks about Australia. And I talked to the, the Prime Minister of Australia only recently. And Australia has just, with great difficulty, made the commitment to get to net zero by 2050. It's a great thing. Uh, and, Mr Speaker, the, I, talked to, I talked yesterday to our Indonesian friends, uh, for instance, Joko Widodo, a good friend of this country, uh, who's agreed on coal uh, to bring forward the, uh, the abolition of coal use in Indonesia to 2040, Mr Speaker. A fantastic effort by the Indonesians. I talked to President Putin, uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, Mr Speaker, and he confirmed, he confirmed his determination to get to net zero uh, by the middle of the century. And that, that is what the UK is doing, working with countries around the world to get the outcome we want. It's still too early to say whether it will succeed, Mr Speaker. It's in the balance. The thing the Prime Minister has underestimated throughout these last two years is COP26 is not a glorified photo opportunity. It is a fragile and complex negotiation. And, and the problem is bo boost, boosterism, bo the Prime Minister's boosterism won't cut carbon emissions in half. Photo opportunities won't cut carbon emissions in half. Can I just say to the Prime Minister, in these, in these final days before COP26, we need more than warm words. Above all, Glasgow has got to be a summit of climate delivery, not climate delay. Yeah. Prime Minister. He talks about cutting CO2 in half. Well, that's virtually what this country, this government has done, uh, Mr Speaker. Since 1990, we've cut CO2 by 44%. Uh, and, and the economy has grown by 78%. And that's our approach, Mr. Speaker. A sensible, pragmatic, conservative approach that cuts CO2, that tackles climate change, and that delivers high wage, high skilled jobs across this country. And our, our net zero plan, Mr. Speaker, will deliver 440,000 jobs. That's what the people in this country want to, want to see. And that's what they're seeing. They're seeing wages up, they're seeing growth up, they're seeing productivity up under this government. And if we left it to the, to the right honourable gentleman, the leader of the opposition, who is sadly not in his place, uh, we would still be in lockdown. But it's a point that he might, he might bring to his attention uh, wherever he is currently self-isolated. Jane Stevenson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will know that both I and my honourable friend, the member for Wolverhampton South West, have lobbied for funding for better training and skills provision for young people in Wolverhampton. Our unemployment rate, youth unemployment, was unacceptably high pre-pandemic and now sadly is the highest rate nationally. Would the Prime Minister urgently look at how the government can level up opportunity so that young people in Wolverhampton can get the skills and the confidence they need to find work? Yeah. Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right about uh, Wolverhampton. That's why we're working flat out uh, to ensure that uh, young people in Wolverhampton benefit from the kickstart, kickstart scheme and uh, we are working with Wolverhampton Council to ensure uh, that young people get bespoke support uh, for their return uh, to work. We now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure the thoughts and prayers of the entire House will be with the family of Walter Smith, who sadly passed away yesterday, the legend that was the Rangers Dundee United and Scotland manager, and many of us will not forget the day that he led us to victory over France at Hamden. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, naturally, most of today's focus and attention will turn to the Chancellor's budget after Prime Minister's question. But before we turn to domestic matters, I think it is right and important to raise the dire humanitarian situation that is developing in Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The World Food Programme estimates that more than half the population 
about 22.8 million people face acute food insecurity. 3.2 million children under five could suffer acute malnutrition. Given the history of the last 20 years, it should be obvious that we have a deep responsibility to this country and to its people. Mr Speaker, they are dying and they need our help. It is only two months since the Allied forces relinquished control of the country. So can the Prime Minister update us on what exactly his government is doing to end the famine in Afghanistan? Here, here, here. Uh, I, I thank the right honourable gentleman uh, and he raises uh, a, uh, a, an issue that I know is on the minds of many people in this House and across the country. We are we're proud of what we have done to, uh, to welcome people from Afghanistan, but we must do everything we can also to mitigate uh, the, uh, the, the, the consequences uh, for the uh, people of Afghanistan of the Taliban takeover. And so what we did, as you, you, as you will recall, is we doubled our uh, aid commitment uh, for this year to £286 million. And we're working with the uh, UN agencies and other NGOs to do everything we can to, to help the people uh, of Afghanistan. What we can't do at the moment is uh, write a, uh, a completely blank cheque uh, to the Taliban uh, government, the Taliban authorities. Uh, we need to ensure that, they, uh, that that country does not slip back into being a haven for terrorism and a narco state. Mr. Speaker, the fact is there is a humanitarian crisis and people are in need today. There is nothing there about tangible actions that the government is taking on the ground now, because the situation is getting worse by the day. In August, the Allies ran away from the responsibilities in Afghanistan, and now it very much feels like this government is washing its hands of the legacy that it left behind. Because not alone are the Afghan people being failed on humanitarian aid, promises made to them on resettlement are also being broken too. The Afghan Citizens Resettlement Scheme was announced on the 18th of August, which talked about resettling up to 20,000 in the coming years. But more than two months on, Mr Speaker, we've heard nothing. The Afghan people are being left with no updates and vague targets. So can the Prime Minister finally tell us when the resettlement scheme will open? Can he guarantee, guarantee Prime Minister, that 20,000 Afghans will be resettled, and when exactly is the deadline for that to happen? Uh, Mr Speaker, we made a commitment to resettle uh, 20,000 Afghans, in addition uh, to those that we brought out under Operation Pitting, which I think most people, most fair-minded people in this country would think was a, a pretty remarkable feat uh, by UK armed services. And many of, them are, uh, many of, the, of, the, of those 15,000 are already being integrated into, uh, into the UK, into, into schools, into, into communities, and we will help them in any way that, uh, that we can. And one of the reasons, and he, I'm afraid he's completely wrong in his characterisation of the, 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 the stance the UK has taken towards Afghanistan and, and, the, change, and the changes there, we continue to engage. Uh, we engage with the Taliban. This country was the f one of the first uh, to, to reach out and begin a dialogue. Uh, and what we, what, we, what we are insisting on is safe passage, Mr Speaker. And, I, and, and, and what we are insisting on, just to get to his point where he rather uncivilly calls out, uh, what we are insisting on, Mr Speaker, is that there is safe passage uh, for those who wish to come and settle in this country, uh, for people to whom we owe an obligation. And that is what we are doing, Mr Speaker. And I have answered the question. Thank you. Um, as the whole House will know, today is National Cheese Toasty Day. Yeah, 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 yeah. A, 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 a massive... It's a fact. A massive 4.3 billion toasties were consumed last year. They are the nation's favourite snack. And Gloria Somerset is the home of cheddar cheese. So, with the news that Wyke Farms in my constituency is now producing what I think is the world's first entirely carbon neutral cheddar cheese. Did my right honourable friend know that eating cheddar from Somerset can reduce your, your cheese consumption carbon footprint by 55%? So, will my right honourable friend support our vital dairy industry by committing to enjoying a carbon neutral cheese toasty today?
Well, Mr. Speaker, my, my only question is why is it only National Cheese Toasty Day? Why isn't it International Cheese Toasty Day? I hope very much that, uh, amongst its many achievements, the COP26 summit uh, will bring the, bring the entire global community uh, to a better understanding of the White Farms carbon neutral uh, cheese toasty. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister will be aware of the harm that the Northern Ireland Protocol is doing to the political and economic stability of Northern Ireland and uh, the very delicate constitutional balance created by the Belfast or Good Friday Agreement. In the command paper published by the Government in July, uh, they uh, committed uh, to addressing these issues and recognised that the protocol is simply not sustainable. Does the Prime Minister accept that the conditions now exist to trigger Article 16 of the protocol in the event that the current negotiations with the EU fail to arrive at an acceptable outcome. So we can negotiate. Uh, the, the, the right honourable gentleman is, is, is completely right. Uh, I'm sad to say, in what he says, and uh, we're working hard to secure uh, an agreement by negotiation. Uh, but we need to uh, see real progress because he knows the, the real life issues on the ground in Northern Ireland haven't uh, gone away and uh, if we can't see progress as we've been saying now for some months if we can't see rapid progress uh, in the way that we spelt out in our command paper then I, I think that it's clear to everybody that the conditions for invoking article 16 have already been met one bit more thank you mr speaker the airedale hospital in my constituency is made predominantly from aerated concrete which is known for its structural deficiencies and is now in desperate need of a new rebuild as the prime minister will be aware the airedale hospital recently submitted its bid to government for a brand new carbon neutral hospital it is fantastic news that this conservative government will deliver 48 new hospitals but can i make an urgent plea to the prime minister that the Air Airdale is one of them. Uh, well, yes, Mr. Speaker, here will be my honourable friend. We're hearing a little bit more. Indeed, the whole House will be hearing uh, more about uh, the, the, the spending for health in, in just a few moments. But I can tell him uh, that we've received 120 applications for the biggest uh, hospital building programme in a generation, and uh, his uh, application will certainly be amongst those who will get our most urgent consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This government is failing women and girls, from lack of rape prosecutions, no victims bill, to letting criminals off the hook. And now women and girls, including my own children, are being targeted with a sinister form of spiking through injections. Yeah. It's always women and girls who pay the heaviest price. Yeah. Now they are taking a stand today and saying enough is enough. So how many more women and girls will be hunted or excluded before the Prime Minister himself finally takes a stand? Yeah. Mr Speaker, the reports of spiking are extremely disturbing and, and as the Honourable Lady knows, it's already uh, a criminal offence and I know that the Home Secretary, my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has asked the police uh, to update her on exactly uh, what details they have of what is happening. She wants to give them the space for the time being uh, to conduct their, their inquiries into what's going on. But I would ask everybody with information about such incidents to come forward and contact their local police. Yeah. Morris. With COP26 being imminent, I would like to draw attention to what good work is being done in Morecambe with the Eden Project. Wes Johnson at Morecambe and Lancaster College has put forward a programme to teach youngsters in Morecambe um, the international Eden ethos to, shall we say, propagate the, the goodwill around the world. I would like to invite the Prime Minister to come to Morecambe and come to the Morecambe Riviera to see the Eden Project site at the earliest convenience. Thank you. I'm, I'm, Mr. Speaker, I'm delighted to, to respond uh, in the affirmative, but to my honourable friend, because I think the last time he asked me about this, it was to ensure that we got an Eden project uh, in Morecambe. So it sounds from what he's saying as though, the, as though we're making progress in that direction, and that, uh, that uh, is thrilling. Ben Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure the whole House will want to send uh, my right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition, our best wishes. Yeah. And it's also good, Mr Speaker, to see a few more Conservative MPs heeding the Health Secretary's plea and wearing masks. Yeah. Yeah. 
But given we have had for several weeks now COVID infection, hospitalisation and death rates far, far higher than any other Western European country, was it a mistake to abandon all those precautions back in July? And if not, why are our figures so bad? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I thank the, the Honourable Gentleman for his, his question, but uh, the reality is that, of course, uh, we... Uh, monitor all the data very carefully every day, but we see nothing uh, to, to suggest that we need to deviate from the, the plan that we've set out uh, th that began with the, the roadmap in February uh, and that we are sticking to that has given uh, business and given this country uh, to get on uh, and achieve uh, the unlockings that we've seen and, and indeed the fastest economic growth in the G7. Jane Hunt. My love for constituents, Sophia Dady, has composed a song about the positive action we can each take to combat climate change, which emphasises the need to clean, protect, repair and protect. Will the Prime Minister join me in encouraging all UK schools to follow the lead of Fairfield Prep School in Loughborough and other schools across the world from Hawaii to Norway in raising awareness of this important issue through learning the song? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, well, yes, Mr. Speaker. Do I have to learn the song? Uh, I, 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 I will, I will, I'll do my best, Mr. Speaker. And I, I thank uh, my honourable friend for raising the work of her constituents and her, and her constituent school. And it is absolutely vital that we not only uh, recycle where uh, it's sensible, but above all, we cut down on the use of plastics, Mr. Speaker. Sarah Tiltar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week, it was revealed that fossil fuel companies, interest groups, and climate denialists have donated £1.3 million to the Conservative Party and its MPs since 2019. So, a simple question: no waffling or dodging the issue. On the eve of COP26, will the Prime Minister demonstrate that he is serious about tackling the climate emergency by paying back this money and pledging that his party will never again take money and donations from the fossil fuel companies that are burning our planet? Yes or no? Uh, Mr Speaker, all our donations are registered in the normal way, and I just remind her that uh, the Labour Party's paymasters, the, the GMB, uh, I think, Labour's policies mean that no families would have been able to take one flight every five years, Mr. Speaker, and have their cars confiscated. Martin Vickers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this week it's UK Wind Week, and uh, later, later this afternoon I will. Later this afternoon, I will be welcoming some young people from my constituency who, are, who see their futures in the renewable energy sector, which has done so much to level up the Grimsby, Cleethorpes and North East Lincolnshire. Will the Prime Minister give an assurance that the Government will continue to invest in the skills and development of our young people to benefit the uh, uh, regional uh, renewable energy sector? Yes. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, and uh, I think the whole House should be proud of the fact that the, the UK now produces more offshore wind, than, uh, still produces more offshore wind than it, not, uh, not hot air, Mr Speaker, uh, but energy for the people of this country. Uh, clean, green energy uh, produced off Cleethorpes, off the, in the North Sea, and we're, going, we're massively going to be increasing uh, the volume of that output, Mr Speaker. Stephen Kinner. Mr Speaker, a thriving steel industry is the foundation of a more productive and resilient Britain. Yet bickering between the Chancellor and the Business Secretary is blocking the chance to tackle the sky-high energy prices that our steelmakers have been facing since long before the current price spikes. With a pathway to net zero dependent on steel firms using more electricity, not less, will he urge his colleagues around the Cabinet table to now put in place a wholesale energy price cap, along with long overdue reductions in network connection costs? Mr Speaker, COP won't work without a cap. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, he's making a very important point about the high energy costs for, uh, for energy intensive industries, and that's why we've abated them but with about £2 billion since 2013. But the answer is to do what we're doing uh, to make up the long term baseload needs of this economy by investing in, in nuclear, which I'm afraid uh, Labour failed to do in their 13 uh, lost years, Mr Speaker, as well as in renewables. Prime Minister's questions. 